Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's Gordon Einstein, your Dubai resident crypto and blockchain attorney. And I have a really special and unusual show today. I had the chief economist of Israel on the show, uh, Shmuel Abramson. Abramson? I, I, I know I'm messing this up. All great. All Is good. that okay? Okay. I, I should Perfect. Good better, afternoon. But, you know, maybe, I, maybe that's a diplomatic faux pas. Anyways, I, I, we had a chance to meet each other because I had the good fortune to visit, good fortune to visit Israel, was it two or three months ago now? And meet with him in his office and discuss some policy matters. And of course, we, we found some commonality and some common ground. It's the first time I've ever had the chief economist of any country on the, the show. So it's a, uh, it's kind of exciting. I, I, I'm gonna try to you know, work my way through it. Um, but welcome to the show. And I think you said that this is the first time you've been on a show like this yourself? Is that yes, first first podcast ever for me. I'm very very excited to be here and thank you for the the opportunity. My pleasure. And you know what? We'll we'll learn and we'll experience together because it's my first time doing someone kind of political. So th th this is neat for me. So let's let's just start. Let's just start from the beginning. What does it mean to be the chief economist of Israel? What does that entail? Okay, so the, the chief economist is uh, is a senior bureaucrat that reports to the Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, the Israeli model of a chief economist means we do basically three things. Um, I would say I'm the inter internal consultancy um, within the Ministry of Finance, kind of the, um, the broad mind, the consultant on economic matters to all the other units within the Ministry of Economy, means I follow the economy, I do research, I do forecasting. Uh, we do the macroeconomic forecasting, the uh, the inflation forecasting and so forth. So that's maybe our main main uh, role. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, we we also take policy issues and then advise on them. Um, could be very, very broad portfolio. We deal with the labor market and the real estate market and anything that really um, interest the, the government or the Minister of Finance. And there's sometimes actually some very interesting the, uh, projects we do at the request of, of our peers or the Minister of Finance, including digital asset uh, regulation that we were requested to look at. That's, that's my main role. I will say also I'm in charge of uh, tax policy. So we, we also uh, host the tax policy unit in Israel. And I'm also in charge of international relations, international affairs of, of the ministry. So I have uh, quite a lot of uh, interactions with uh, with peers all over the globe, uh, which is really great. It's really interesting. And so that's me. Because it's Israel, I, I just learned you generally don't work on Friday because I guess it's pre-Shabbat. And you're nice enough to be right. in your office to do uh, this, this call during what's not a working day. Is that correct? Yeah, but we, we like to do things of pleasure. So this is uh, more pleasure than business and uh, very, very happy to be here. Plus, I live very close to the office, so uh, no worries. Find out detail close to the office. I like it. Now, you you said to, you said Ministry of Finance one, a few times, but you also said Ministry of the Economy. Are they separate things or is it just the same terminology for the same unit? Yeah, yeah. So the Ministry of uh, of finance in Israel is like the treasury in the United States. Ministry of Economy is more like the trade um, secretary. So we are more um, kind of a headquarters looking from above mm -hmm. at the economy, and the minister and the Ministry of Economy deals with the more uh, actual practical management, like you know trade facilitation and so forth. But we do the more the policy and. The main anchor, I would say, is the budgeting. So um, that affects all other ministries, including non-economic ministries. So you can imagine by budgeting the, for example, the education ministry, we also affect education policy. Or budgeting the health ministry, we affect health policy. So it's quite a unique and powerful position in the government. Interesting. And then the the regulation of the securities markets, for example or the commodities markets, is that under your umbrella or is that a separate entity? No, so in Israel, like in, uh, I think most, uh, at least Western countries, regulators are, are fairly independent. So we have um, regulators that are, are independent. Our 
we have three financial regulators um, in Israel. We have the banking regulator that sits in the central bank, which is uh, completely separate from the uh, from the government. And then we have two other regulators that they report to the Minister of Finance, but they are um, fairly independent, which is the equivalent of the SEC. Yes. In Israel, we call it the ISA and uh, uh, the regulator of the capital markets. It deals especially with insurance, but also with... Um, with other uh, financial entities. Interesting. So let me kind of go down that route because that's a little bit of my background. In, in, U, in, the, in the USA, sorry, in the USA, the Securities and Exchange Commission is a commission. It's not a single appointed individual. It's a it's a board of five members that the majority party appoints three and the minority party appoints two, and then the majority party appoints the chairman of the commission. Is it a commission in Israel or is it a single person? Would say regulating the no no so so it's it's quite different i think we are closer to uh um to other more maybe european kind of uh systems mm -hmm. um the, the there is a committee but at the end of the day um those that sit on the committee and those that actually manage are bureaucrats professional bureaucrats by the way i didn't introduce myself too much but i'm also um a professional bureaucrat that's that that's my thing public policy junkie grew up in the in the system did some other things uh in the middle of course and went to study abroad in the united states but the people that manage regulation in israel are are not like in the u.s appointed um on on their political ticket they they are appointed at the end of the day by the cabinet but um, they have to be very, very uh, professional and in many cases also grow up in the system. Interesting. Um, and they don't have a political affiliation, at least not an official one. No one knows. No one knows it's supposed to know who I voted. Okay. For and, I, and I want to ask you, so let's go a little bit into biography. So were you born in Israel or abroad or what's your background? Yeah, I was born in Israel 44 years ago. I'm nice. 44 years old. Um I uh, was born actually in the south, but in the last uh, twenty something years, been living in Jerusalem, and this is where I studied also at the Hebrew University. Um, I've spent two extended periods of my life in the United States in South California, both as a kid, and then done my PhD in South California in uh, the Rand Corporation. Great experience. Um, yeah, so in the past twenty years, I was dealing with public policy this way or the other. I uh, worked in several ministries. I worked in think tanks. I uh, worked at the Rand Corporation in the United States and then in a think tank in Israel um, and did some very, very uh, diverse and interesting uh, positions in the Israeli government. I'm very lucky about it, I have to say. First of all, as I said, I'm a public policy junkie, so it's it's really my thing and I'm enjoying uh, most days, almost every day uh, in, my, in my work. And I, I was... Uh, lucky enough to deal with a very broad portfolio over the years. I've been doing the macro policy mm -hmm. and financial uh, policy and more micro policy and some issues with uh, even connected to security and economy. So very, very broad things that you can do uh, in the government. And I've landed in my current position a year ago after being the deputy of the previous chief economist. Interesting. And let's go... Let's go in that background a little bit. You know, I, I think I mentioned when I was there, and I think we discussed since then, my, my dad actually worked at the Rand Corporation. So that was our Amazing. interesting and surprising common touch point. And, and for, for the audience, that, that's a think tank that sort of sprang out of the Cold War in the U.S. It's just for research and development. And it's in beautiful, or what used to be somewhat beautiful, it depends on your point of view, Santa Monica, California. And it was always... It was a, I wouldn't say it was a military oriented think tank, but it was sort of, it was definitely government affiliated and sort of, you know, my, my dad was in the Air Force and he worked there and, it, you know, he went off and did, you know, spy satellite analysis for Rand Corporation. Is there, is it, was there a security or military or industrial policy aspect to what you studied when you were there? So uh, the Rand Corporation has, uh, transitioned a lot over the years. You're, you're absolutely right. It came. It was a spin-off of the Air Force originally, and then they uh, created it as a separate uh, entity, separate NGO, mm -hmm. which is a think tank. And you're absolutely right. They were very, very um, close uh, to the government and all around the uh, 
Cold War. Um, but in recent years, they've also, um, but it's quite a few decades, they also have a very substantial non-military operation, civilian policy stuff. They do a lot of health mm -hmm. um, and other very, very interesting things. As, um, you know, as I, you know uh, I, I, I do have to admit, my impression of the Rand Corporation is, is, of course, related to the time when my dad was alive and working there. So this is like, like, like you know, 70s and 80s. And then, you so know, he was I, from the Air, Air Force, I, I assume, right? That's what you said. Well, he, he was a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force. And then after he retired, uh, he was at, originally at the Pentagon when at the end of his Air Force career. And then we moved to San Monica, California, so that he could join Rand. But this was during the, when the Cold War was still happening. I was, made, and that was the, when the, my impression of it got formed. You're obviously a later generation, so you're, you're probably more up to date on what it became post Cold War. And you know, obviously, my direct connection to it, you know, it was a long time ago. Right. There's a really interesting history of the Rand Corporation around the Cold War. If anybody wants, you can Google, and there's also a movie about it about the Pentagon Papers. Uh, so there were also a lot of scandals around what happened there around the, uh, the Cold War. But the basic is that there were a bunch of very smart people, like your dad, I'm sure, uh, oh. that were very much involved uh, in, in helping the U.S. government manage the challenges of the Cold War. And I think they we, we can look back and say they, they actually succeeded. Um, but due to different reasons, Rand has kind of um, moved to be uh, also more strong on civilian issues and sure. working uh, with also non uh, other entities that are not the U.S. government. So they have a lot of other entities. But I think, you know, I haven't been the Rand Corporation for 10 years. So so me, myself, I'm not I'm not fully up to date. But what, what's going on there? I think one of the big issues they're dealing with now is is actually technological regulation, te and technology policy, all the issues of AI, which I think is also very, very relevant to your podcast and issues of, you know, new digital assets, technological change, huge, huge questions for the, uh, say for humanity, they're trying to kind of figure it out. Fair enough. So as chief economist, let me kind of bring it back forward. So as chief economist of Israel, obviously it's a vibrant country it's a very dynamic country. I just, you know, did an interview with Collider Ventures a couple of days ago. We were talking about that before starting reporting. It's also a small country, and it's also a country that deals with some neighbors that are friendly and some neighbors that, that are less so friendly. Can you kind of describe the challenges and opportunities of being a chief economist? Like, does, does this affect your life, or how do you how do you approach yeah. it? Being unique okay, so for my idea. Yes, yes. So first of all, yeah, as you said, it's a, we, we are, I think, a fascinating economy, very interesting economy that really is a, is a unique story um, with of being a developing country, by the way, if you go back several decades ago, becoming a, a super developed country. Uh, so there are only a few countries that really grew so fast, like Israel over the years, um, yeah. maybe uh can compare us to Korea, Japan, UAE has also grown very, very rapidly, coming from a non-developed to a very developed country. Mm. Our um, uh, our secret, I would say, is, is our human capital, is the is the spirit of the people, and also the talent that we have here. We're called the startup nation. Uh, that's how we were coined. Just uh, this week, um, there was this publication of the top universities in the world. So three of the Top 100 universities in the world are Israeli, and and this is what our economy is based on. We have the highest uh, high tech, the, the largest high tech sector in terms of GDP, um, R and D, largest investments, and so forth. So, very very interesting and vibrant uh, economy that's been growing very nicely in recent years. You're absolutely right. We're also uh, dealing with substantial challenges and the biggest challenge currently is of course the security challenge um the geopolitical challenge that we're dealing with um we all pray for better uh future on that uh peace to come to the whole region 
And when that will happen, um, I'm sure we're going to grow much better. And we, we had some, uh, in recent years, also some good progress with Abraham Accords, mm-hmm. um, which just gave us a, a small taste of the potential that can be here in the region. And Israel being part of, uh, you know, the progress of, of all our neighbors together. So we're hoping for that to happen very soon. And in the meantime, it's definitely a challenge. Uh, Sorry, can I jump in for a second? Hopefully the so, current uh, war will end. Yeah. So the, um, it's, it's funny that that echoes a little bit the conversation. Sorry to interrupt. That echoes a little bit of the conversation I had with Collider. We we had, and I want I want to get your take on something they said, which is the um, there's not what, what they said is that when companies form in Israel, there's no from their perspective at least with tech, it, there's not an Israeli domestic market. It's not kind of worth it because it's so small they immediately build to be international and specifically with the u.s in mind there's, there's no middle you know there there because you know if you if, if israel was geographically normal i'm doing that in air quotes you could start building for the domestic market then the regional then the global but the regional is impaired because of the political situation right now so they they have to kind of leapfrog right away to being international which kind of affects everything that they do. Do you? What, what, what's I think that's, that's that's true. That's right. Uh, we have a small market. We're only ten million people. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, and we don't have you know, the, we're not part of the EU, like a small country in Europe. And you're absolutely right. So we, we have to kind of leap to the global arena, mm-hmm. and that's why our uh, I would say our. Specific, we have a special business relation beyond also the political, but relation with the United States, especially. So a lot of our uh, funding for the high tech comes from the United States, and a lot of high tech, Israeli high tech companies look face the United States and look at the United States as their main market. But of course, there's also a lot of activity vis-a-vis the EU. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, by the way, there's also the other way. So we have a bunch of international companies having Israeli presence, major, major companies from the United States, all the big ones. So be it Intel and Apple and um, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. NVIDIA now has also an arm in Israel. So all of these large American companies uh, have very, very substantial presence here. So it's it's both ways. And we're definitely a very global high-tech scene. So I was under the impression, but maybe I was wrong, that the larger companies that you just named, the primary focus is setting up research institutions in Israel. But I, I think I heard recently that Intel actually has a chip fab. Am I am I on the right track? Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. Israel has a chip uh, fab for many decades here. And actually, they just signed uh, earlier this year uh, a contract with the government, an agreement to expand their fab to um, remake it and reinvest in it. So, so it is a big deal. So, we, we have also some uh, industrial activity. Not everything is R and D, mm-hmm. but at the same time, it, it is fair to say that our relative advantage is R and D. Intel, beyond the fab, they also have large R and D capacity here too. Sure, interesting. It's, it's funny the the. One of the founders of Intel, and of course I forget his name, he was he was throwing shade at AMD, and he said real men have fabs, because AMD was just doing design, and Intel right. this that I'm manufacturing also, so I, that's that's one of my more favorite quotes. The, um, so let's go, let's go back to the neighborhood a little bit, and I, you know I don't know what's okay to say or what's not not okay to say. The I live in the UAE. I was actually part, part of the reason. I'll say everything is okay to say. In Israel, we're open and we can talk about the toughest things. And please, fine, okay, good. Yeah, you well, fine. I'll, I'll then, then I'll plow ahead and we'll see what happens. So, look, the, you, you have your relationships with. Uh, let's say there's been waves of peace. So, you know, Jordan and Egypt, kind of early. Is it fair to say that there's full commercial relationships between those countries and Israel? So with. With Jordan and Egypt, um, there is official diplomatic relations, but the poten- I, I must say the potential is still yet to be proven. Uh, so unfortunately, there's it, 
it didn't grow as much as we hoped it would grow. And but but on the other way, we just look at it as as something that can grow and can increase its potential. Um, I think with the UAE, we had oh, uh, exactly. a, a much stronger dynamic. That's so. If you compare mm -hmm. Egypt and, and Jordan to UAE, with UAE there was a lot of quicker expansion of the ties. Uh, and currently, of course, there's substantial challenges also around the war. But um, the potential is huge, both with Egypt and Jordan and uh, UAE and other countries also hopefully soon to join the circle of peace. So is there any legal limitation on commerce between Jordan and, and, and Egypt or is the issue elsewhere? No, no, it, it, there's no uh, legal, not at all legal issues there's actually even a what's called a quiz which is um a free trade zone that we have both with egypt and with with jordan so there are actually activities of of israeli and uh, egypt slash jordan uh, factories working together things are happening but when you look at the levels of trade and investment then you see that they're fairly small and hopefully they will grow in the future and i think a lot of it will have to do also with the peace and normalization sure. in the region so what's it like can an israeli businessman or woman go to jordan as an israeli and do business comfortably or, or is it kind of weird and strange first of all absolutely they can do it uh, technically they can do it they can get a visa and they do it all the time there's a lot uh, of people doing it. actually by the way i know if all of your listeners know this, 20% of Israeli population are Arabs, so they yeah. speak Arabic, most of them are Muslim, and they culturally make, it's very easy for them also to travel to Jordan, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but the, but again, I think the potential is, is much larger than we see today, and I think a lot of it has to do, as we understand, with the geopolitics, and... Um, that's the issue. It's not a legal issue. It's a geopolitical um, tensions that that exist, I, I unfortunately. Okay, so uh, and then work, working outwards to the sort of the Abraham Accords circle, when when those relationships got formed a few years ago, you know, I, I'll, I'll agree with you. My my impression was a lot of things moved very quickly, especially in Dubai, especially in the UAE. It was pleasant and neat to see, but I, I think it's a little bit obviously a little bit down post October 7th and given the current situation but there but it established itself at a much higher level than what you saw with Jordan in, in, in Egypt more so quickly is that what I'm hearing I, I think that's true yeah I think that's true there was we, we were happy to see that things were established much quicker and higher rates and you know I think it has to do also to some degree with the with the type of the economy uh, the UAE is uh is really a global hub, very, very open, very, very uh, inspiring and very impressive. And they are, they, they're good at that. They've developed that of really having international ties and making the best out of it. Super uh, impressive, uh, admirable. And uh, we look forward that after the current uh, situation that we're in, we'll keep on increasing that. I agree with you. The, in my brain, you know, obviously the UAE is made up of all these different emirates. So there seems to be a lot of commonality maybe between Dubai and Israel specifically, because you have two areas where, you know, Dubai is not the one with the oil. Dubai is the one that with the dream and the people, and they built their mecca, for lack of a better word, of, of tourism and trade and finance and everything else, just because they have the vision. And they just kind of went, for, they just kind of went for it, which is, you know, a bit of the Israeli model. Is, is anything, you know, I, I think Israel was on the road to peace with Saudi Arabia and then all the hubbub started. Is there trade happening with Saudi or is that off the table until things get handled? There's no official um, ties with uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I don't know to comment too much on what's happening off, off okay. that. Fair enough. So let's move on to digital assets. So you mentioned earlier in your description of the chief economist role that you're, you're I think I heard. But it is, it is it is worth saying that I think we all understand that, especially with the Saudi Arabia, the potential is huge, huge, huge. Yes. And 
the day that we'll be able to go back to to the peaceful trends in the region, but really the sky is the limit, uh, including with Saudi. I can't wait. That's actually part of why I'm here. So like you help build these ties and you know make everyone get along and get things done. I I think that's I think it's gonna be a beautiful place. We were, I think we're I think, uh, we're I think we were starting we all can't wait place. and unfortunately um some forces in the region are not so much interested in the prosperity of the region, so have been you know delaying it. But at the end of the day I believe that the human spirit will will prevail here also. Nice. I like it. Okay, I'm I'm pumped up. All right, now let's let's go to maybe the more prosaic. Okay, digital assets and the regulation of crypto and blockchain in Israel. Can you can you give me a, sort of a top level view of the perspective of the, of the government on this on this sector? Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge question, and uh, I think all governments are are dealing with uh, with really with this huge question. Israel's position, first of all, we, we are as you said a small market. And um, we very, as a small market, small country, we very much look to see what other uh, countries are doing um, because of it being such a complicated issue with a lot of, you know, questions and I think regulators all over the world, uh, unfortunately, are always kind of behind and it takes us time to, to understand uh, mm -hmm. private sectors running, you know, innovating and regulators have been uh, fairly slow to really um, address this. Um, in many ways, we are following what's happening in the EU, uh, EU and what's happening uh, in the United States or will happen. We, we're holding our breath to see. Uh, there's some interesting, uh, I'm sure you've been following very closely, some interesting statements from both from uh, uh, Trump and from the Democratic Party also on what's going to happen after mm -hmm. elections with the with digital assets. So we will be following that and of course also be very much uh, affected and, and probably follow suit this way or the other. Um, locally, we, um, we have a few challenges that as regulators, I'm not a regulator, but I've been involved in regulatory policy that we need to deal with. And there's a lot of places where we can improve um, because I, we really believe there's a lot of also potential for digital assets to help us in, in, in different areas. Um, but I will say just quickly, and we can dive into specific issues, but uh, we have to get uh, the issue of, of paying taxes being uh, dealt with. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, currently here, there's too many hurdles for people to, to pay taxes the right way on their earnings. Uh, the issue of, of banking services. So the banking sector has been quite difficult in enabling money from digital assets to enter the traditional system, the banking system. Uh, a lot of it is connected to AML, but probably it's a, it's a broader issue. Mm -hmm. And then there was also uh, issues of, you know, of the whole licensing of service providers. Um, and we've made some progress, but even here, we, there's a lot more to do and really to establish this understanding of how we grant licenses to make uh, those players that are really there for improving, you know, the lives of people to, to provide these services in, in, in the right manner with managing the risks. Is there, is there this role big enough? Well, l l l let me say related an experience and then I have a, a pointed question. I was in Malta uh, and Gibraltar five, six years ago, maybe seven years ago. And they both kind of position themselves, ironically, as crypto islands. You know, Gibraltar is more like, a, you know, a peninsula, but they kind of wanted to put themselves as that, as one of those offshore jurisdictions that was taking advantage of their nimble, clever, iconoclastic approach, just like Bahamas, just like Singapore, just like everyone else, to kind of position themselves as a lead so that the slow fumbling giants of the US and the EU could slowly catch up. In the meantime, they could Make hay, while, make hay while the sun shines. What unfortunately happened with Malta is they talk a good game, but their, regula their regulatory, the regulators weren't up to the task. They weren't able to execute. And the banks, like such as Bank of Aleta and everyone else, now there's construction, of course, weren't, weren't able to then 
provide banking services to any com any company that got licensed. Gibraltar, being a little bit smaller, kind of focused on crypto funds and made some headway. Is Israel, does it have enough critical mass and enough expertise to implement a comprehensive approach to crypto and blockchain? Or is it somehow maybe lacking in the size to really pull it off? Okay, so so to be honest, I don't think we're there yet. Okay. okay. Um, I'm surprised. I, I haven't been following Malta and Gibraltar too closely, but I'm not surprised at what you said. Uh, they too are small economies. They they don't even sm much smaller than Israel, so they don't have really a market of uh, local um, consumers. And so I think their position was different. And then you ask yourselves, if what what are they really offering? If will they offer a situation where people will say, okay, if it's licensed in Malta or in Gibraltar or in some other small place, will we accept it as? as you know as a trustworthy provider and i think, think there's a question with that i think most the largest uh uh consumers would want to see the us giving its approval want to see the eu giving its approval and um, perhaps the uk these are the the main ones there's some by the way there's some very interesting stuff as you probably know better than me happening in singapore yes and some interesting stuff happening also in the uae in uh, in Dubai specifically. So um, I think you need some mass of regu regulatory ability. And I don't think at this point Israel is, is there yet. Uh, we will be eventually, but currently we're not very, very developed with that. Part of it is, is really the need to kind of manage the risks. Um, and we're still looking into it. I don't. I don't think that a very small country can really succeed in that. That's my my take on this. Okay, but is Israel a really small country when it comes to this sort of thing? It sort of punches above its weight in several categories. I, I'm trying to gauge whether it's even possible. Right. It, it might be. I just don't know. Yes, but I don't think. <laughs> I'm very very honest here. Um, Please, I'm a, I think we're we're, we're huge and bigger than our size when it comes to high tech and areas where government uh, in high tech sector and we have amazing stuff and also connected to digital assets happening and and companies like Collider that you, you interviewed, but also other very interesting stuff happening mm -hmm. in areas where you don't need too much regulatory uh, involvement. I see. When it, when it comes to um, regulatory um, lead, leadership and providing services, uh, I think, and I'm very, very honest, we still have a way to go. And we are learning from our peers. We're following what's happening in Singapore. It's happening in the UAE. And we will follow suit. But at this point of time, uh, there wasn't a de decision made to really lead this uh, uh, this trend. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think it's, re it's really worth seeing what's going to happen in the EU and, uh, and the United States. The U U EU has taken some approach. Some would say it's a very conservative approach. Um, and But currently, the good the good thing to say about the EU is that they at least they have something in place. So yeah, you're, in, you're at least they were Mika. able to pass Mika, right, Mika, yeah. whatever it's, uh, it's called. So yeah, for example, Mika, so at least they have something in place. It's a, it's a, it's a benchmark. It's a useful benchmark. And for us, as a small country, it's currently the uh, the most substantial benchmark that we are going to follow. If the UK or the United States will establish something different, we might revisit the way we see it. I don't see us as, you know, creating a new standard at this point, at least. Fair enough. So the, it's a really interesting point you're making. The, and I hadn't thought about it. The There's businesses that can take off when the government sort of, sort of gets out of the way. And Israel might be good at that or when resources are put into it. But where there needs to be a large and sophisticated regulator with sufficient mass and sufficient hands-on, maybe that's not what Israel is specialized at. They, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. The, um, but maybe, maybe two areas of low-hanging fruit is what you talked about, the clarification of the tax issues and the more increased efficiency of the banking sector. 
Yeah, Gordon, I just want to kind of clarify. I think there definitely could be areas where we can also be uh, innovative and leaders in regulation. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that digital assets is, is specifically the area. So th- there are some other areas uh, that we're trying to be ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to maybe AI regulation, um, issues of, uh, you know, uh, uh, UAVs, for instance, the way you manage the uh, the space for them and, and so forth. But but I am very honest with you. I don't think in digital assets. If you're going to actually attempt to regulate AI, you, you might as well regulate crypto. I might as well, excuse me, didn't hear you. If you if you if, if you are gonna actually take on the huge scary beast called AI, from a regulatory perspective, you, you might as well take on crypto while you're at it. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's, it's a like, huge challenge. Like the easier one. Right, right. But but you know, I think financial regulation is really special, and and I think the private sector has to understand also that there's regulation and then there's financial regulation and. There's special sensitivities and special risks that are related also to the financial sector. Uh, just to be honest, you know, and look back at 2008, 2009, regulators really didn't understand what's going on. They hoped for, you know, self-regulation, and they ended up in a situation where financial innovation really um, put a lot of risks on the whole system. So I think financial regulation, regulators are very, very cautious as we speak. Okay, and in Israel, of course, super cautious, and that's that's a problem in many ways. But you know, that's just the way things rolled out. Um, is it super cautious culturally, or, or is there some specific reason? So the, there's there's specific reasons for financial uh, regulators to be specifically cautious. Um, many of them were just you know hurt, and uh, they understand that a financial large financial crisis. Uh, is really detrimental for the economy. So what happened in 2008, 2009, by the way, not in Israel, because our regulators are very, were very conservative. But I know you, you remember 2008, 2009, the, uh, the big collapse. There were points at time that, that people actually thought that they were, were heading towards a meltdown of the whole system. There were some points at time that... So, I think the risks, because of contagion, and because it's it's really uh, it's a f- potential effect of really many many lives, then we find the financial regulators to be very very cautious, and in Israel specifically, yes. And and by the way, this caution comes with a price. So we mentioned it beforehand. So when you're so cautious, then sometimes you you hinder competition and innovation, and it's definitely true also for, for Israel, um, but but I'm very, very honest. This is the situation we are in, and hopefully we'll move a bit toward the center there, but but it, but it's still a process to do. Fair enough. Maybe there's potential collaboration between BARA, the Dubai regulator, and Israeli regulators. I think they're both similarly situated, and... But my experience with Vara is it's it's they're not cowboys, they're being slow and me- and methodical and not taking a lot of risk. The you know FTX did not melt down in Dubai; they weren't really welcome. And you know the the ones that are really pushing the envelope in a bad way aren't aren't welcome. They seem to they seem to be doing okay. So maybe Israel can adopt something similar and that can increase the traffic back and forth between these two jurisdictions. Absolutely. And I think we have a lot to do with learning from Dubai regulators. I'm really looking forward to develop that. It's uh, it's on my list of tasks and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to learn from uh, Dubai on that and from other countries or from Singapore as we, yeah. we go ahead. And we, we have to learn from their experience. And I'm sure they're doing some good stuff. So let's, let's shift over to where I think Israel's excelling in this area even if it's in a parallel way which is the, it seems to be very good at infrastructure it seems to be very good at security it seems to be very good at cryptography all of right. which are as, as sort of essential for this new economy and the 
conversations I had with colliders and others, and hopefully I'll name it correctly, is you, you have all these graduates of the 8200 army unit, whatever it is. I, I should probably actually know. <laughs> and these, the people who serve in that unit are 18 or 19 or 20 year olds learning security and hacking and crypto and all this other stuff at like a PhD level. Then they get out of the armed services and they just go work at companies or start at companies. It seems to be a very unique advantage that Israel has, you know, and you and you end up with prior blocks and all these other companies. Um, can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so you're you're exactly right. There's huge, very interesting talent, and I think any serious crypto digital asset company that wants to expand should really look into what's going on in our ecosystem. And you're also absolutely right. We have a relative advantage uh, in the infrastructure area. We have uh, very, very strong talent. Uh, some of it connected to semi-military stuff, uh, cyber security, but also other crypto-related cryptography and other stuff. Um, and we've developed a very, very strong uh, ecosystem. By the way, it's, some of, it's all connected. You know, the world is so connected. So it's also connected to other things that are happening in the whole high-tech uh, ecosystem. And um, there's huge talent and huge uh, value there. Um, because we are a small uh, economy and we have a small consumer base, so I think naturally um, the focus of the high-tech companies or the crypto companies was not at the consumer level, but more at the infrastructure. That's just you know a natural way of things developing. Uh, so applications and you know customer service is less a big deal here. Um, and the infrastructure is a bigger bigger deal. That said, there's also some interesting stuff also happening in, in those other areas. But but you're absolutely right. We have big strength in in those areas. Very good. And the, let's do the good, the bad, and the ugly. Israel's banking system. Tell me about that. Yeah. So the as I hinted in the, in our discussions in Jerusalem when you visit here. Um, the Israeli banking system is uh, is a very is a highly concentrated system, and when you look at the numbers, um, you see there's substantial also market power. They just released their uh, their second quarter reports this week, so it's you know it's it's astonishing. They, their uh, return on equity is among the highest in the world, highest in the OECD at least, mm -hmm. uh, which. For them, it's good, but when I look at it as public sector saying, okay, why are they earning so much? And some of it has to do also with the, with competition. And if you think about it, it means also that there's a lot of opportunities for new players to come in and maybe take some of the, you know, the high profits and share them. And that's what we're hoping that will happen. We're hoping that uh, newcomers will come to the banking system and, uh, you know, shake the system a bit. And make it much more competitive than it is, um, and there, there's a way to go there. So currently, there's the, the system is dominated by two banks that provide more than fifty percent of the of the services, and five banks that provide more than ninety percent services. That doesn't make sense. Um, and this in this uh, context, we hope that you know smaller fintechs, global fintechs, will come and enter our market and really create some more competitive dynamics here. Is there a plan to implement that or is there a plan to attract them or what's what's the way? Yeah, so so the central bank in Israel is, is working on that. The banking supervisor is working on that. We've done different steps in that in that way of 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 developing the really the the regulatory framework I would say for that to happen. Um for example we've um created a, a credit scoring system which didn't exist beforehand. So any new player can be exposed to the uh, credit scores and financial history of all consumers and so forth. So there's issues of information. There's uh, the API regulation that has been, the open banking regulation that has been also uh, uh, accepted here. A lot of things have been uh, happening and we're very, very much open for new players to come. Okay, interesting. So if even if crypto and blockchain aren't 
necessarily at the forefront and maybe won't be for a while. The parallel areas of banking and fintech seem to be open and, and moving along. Is that fair to yeah. say? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I would say that. And I say especially, you know, don't even count on the government. Just you look at the market and you see so much opportunity with such high profits. So it just makes sense for companies to come in. Interesting. Now, let me ask a very open-ended, almost spiritual question, which is for guys like me who are in the neighborhood and want to facilitate peace and growth and harmony and economic activity and technology and just improving the future. And we're sitting here in our apartments, you know, watching this. What can we do in practical terms, given the way the world is right now, but, but not sitting back to make things better and sort of work with the different countries in the region and work with Israel and try to get past what's going on right now and go for a better future? And if, if there's anything, pra I, that's a very holistic kind of spiritual type of question, but yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people that believe in that brighter future that you and I were talking about and kind of and want to do actions that are practical working towards that. That's part of why I have this show. And I think, you know, if you're a policy wonk, that's kind of why you're doing what you're doing. In real life, what do we do? I, I think uh, it's a huge question. I'll try to answer what I think, but it's appropriate I think one of the biggest, big, biggest issues is to make the personal connections. As yeah. soon as we meet each other, as soon as we, and th that's what happened with the, with the Emirates. As soon as Abraham Accords were uh, signed and, you know, airlines have been uh, flying several flights, they, Israelis and Emirate, Emirati people have been meeting and realized very quickly that we are brothers, we're cousins, we're made of the same. We have so much potential. I think the key is, first of all, to start and having these personal relations and personal meetings. And then when you meet the other person, you, you realize that maybe um, some demonization that, you know, that you've been fed up over the years really doesn't lie on anything. So I think there's no, really no um, replacement for personal ties and personal connections. And uh, it's super, super important. And so, as soon as we have those personal ties, that can create a lot of, um, a lot of business opportunities and so forth. So, so I, I think we should start with that. Um, and I think a lot of it also has to do with education. Again, the Emirati uh, uh, government has been very much leading with that, having an open, you know, approach, and uh, not uh, basing your judgment on the of the world on prejudice, but really understanding what you're dealing with, dealing with the facts, um, education, personal relations, I think that's the biggest start. Mm -hmm. um, and then now uh, we will just, we should enable the private sector to lead the way, I think. At the end of the day, when there's opportunities, the private sector knows how to find them and investors know how to find them. And if we don't create hurdles for investments uh, to move here and there, then things will just happen bottom up. That's my thoughts. That's great. Actually, I, now, now that you say it, I, I think that's the right answer. Everyone, everyone's a, you know, everyone's a keyboard warrior, but then when they meet you in person, and it's like th things immediate, things usually just immediately calm down, and then you have a conversation, and you work on something together. And it's like okay, he's okay. Then you kind of you kind of relax. So I, I agree with that. The, um, I, I think that was also part of the benefit that I observed when the UAE crypto delegation came to Israel and you were, you and everyone else was nice enough to host us. You know, it's, it's not, I don't, you know, I don't think anyone came in there with a negative perspective, but they came with a neutral perspective or curious perspective. And they've left, they left with a very positive feeling because of those one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, that we kept on doing in sequence. Plus eating all that Israeli food. I mean, you gotta get a good feeling. You guys really fed us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I heard there's good food in the U in the UAE also. So there's very good food, but it's that. different good food. In Israel, I was overwhelmed by the salads. I mean, you guys do things with salads I I've never even seen. Yeah, there's like a whole yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a, some good, uh, good okay. interesting. We're, we're, we're coming up at the time. Is, is there any final thought or vision or comment you want to leave us with? 
Um, especially thank you, Gordon, for your time and for all the listeners. It's been a pleasure. And uh, hopefully uh, our region is going to grow very soon. Peace come soon. Our hostages come home. Yes. And uh, the future uh, will be bright again. Thank you. Thank you. And, th- and thank you for everything you're doing. I, I really appreciate speaking to someone that with your dedication and background and history and, and candor. And it's 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 a honor for me and a new experience for me to speak to, to someone in government like, like such as yourself. So I'm, I appreciate the opportunity. You're, you're, you know, you never forget your first. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And we welcome anyone who wants to approach us for productive, positive uh, interactions. You can find us on LinkedIn, the Chief Economist department you can follow us and uh, we're looking forward for any positive engagement thank you perfect and i'll put all the i'll put that all that information in the show notes all right very good